So just uh, as we're waiting here for a few, a few more moments, just want to make sure everybody's aware that we won't have a formal um, public comment period. And instead, any members of the public, uh, we have a 30-minute agenda item here where we're going to break. We can mingle with sanctuary staff or sanctuary advisory council members. Uh, so please share your concerns and comments with them. And then after that 30-minute break, it'll be time for the sanctuary advisory council members to ask questions. So also please join me in welcoming our Congresswoman, uh, Debbie Lucarsel Powell. Thank you so much for coming today.
that are really critical because not only will you be protecting the resources within those, you'll also be benefiting the other surrounding area. Um, and then I'm going to only mention um, real briefly um, three different regulations that are proposed. I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the benefits of actions that are proposed to um, minimize physical impacts, um, some of the um, practices that are harmful to some of these species that we're proposing to eliminate, and then also, and real briefly talking about um, how to um, try to balance uses to get at this concept of carrying capacity. So, um, in terms of the um, information that was used to identify what went into this blueprint, this was, as you're all aware, a multi-year process that um, started out with looking at a lot of the extensive data sets we are here. There's a whole series of long-term um, monitoring programs that have been going on, as well as a lot of research that's that's been undertaken throughout the sanctuary. Um, a lot of this information has been put together to develop um, various data products that were very, very helpful in the analysis, including things like the um, Unified Florida um, Habitat Map. Um, some of this research and monitoring looked specifically at how well the different zones were performing, um, starting with surveys that were done prior to their implementation and you know, continuing annually to look at some of the changes. And then one of the real key steps was that a lot of this information was used through this Sanctuary Advisory Council working group um, process and um, really trying to get at some of the goals and the priorities that have been identified through um, the Sanctuary Advisory Council. And I have to mention the last three because these are really, really critical here. One of the things that we have in, in the Florida Keys that I think is absent from a lot of areas is there's a lot of local knowledge. A lot of people are out on the water that um, you know, maybe fishing or other things, and they know a lot about the resources, and that information is really critical in this process. Um, all of the user groups play a really large role in ensuring that we can protect these while balancing um, the uses in these to make sure that um, it is sustainable. And then expert input from scientists and other groups also that was a key step in this process. So I want to only just give you one really brief example of one of the um, data tools that we used. We did something called the Marsan analysis, which is an um, analysis which can help you identify ecologically important areas. And what this process, the process of this involves dividing the sanctuary into these polygons. Basically, there were 21,000 of them. Each of them is about 50 hectares in size. And it took data from all of the different long-term monitoring programs, both the benthic monitoring, the fish monitoring, seagrass um, um, data sets, and used information that included the different habitat types within specific habitats like the reefs, some of the different reefs like um, mid-shelf patch reefs, outer reefs, some reefs that are very high relief versus low relief. And it also used the metrics that are really, really, really critical for a lot of species for fish communities, for corals, other benthic organisms, and some of the plants. All this information was, was, um, was combined, and then ultimately what you get is you get this hotspot map and it shows the areas within the sanctuary that were identified as being the most um, ecologically important. So the red areas are, are the really, really high value areas. Um, and then as you get to yellow and blue um, areas that show up as less high value. Now, I want to make just one caveat here. One of the problems is, is that there isn't data from every single location within the Florida Keys. So this is, we have really good coverage, but there still are areas that are missing, and so there are probably other really highly um, ecologically important areas that are outside of this um, that haven't been included. But the other thing that I want to point is this map is plotted over the existing zones that are in place. And what you can see is a lot of these zones um, include both areas that are very high relief, I mean high value as well as low value, but then there's also a lot of areas that are outside of that. And so we are not going in trying to take every single thing that we say is high value and just protect that because we know that we have to balance this uh, the sanctuary for multiple uses. And we also expect by a lot of our management to have things like what's called spillover happening where this um, um, will benefit some of the surrounding open access areas. Okay, so, so now I'm going to um, 
move into talking specifically about some of the initial findings that we have from the marine zoning strategy that was first implemented in um, 1997. And I'm going to talk specifically about the spas in terms of the target um, species. Um, what this shows, there's, there's three figures here. The red lines represent the, um, the density of each of these species, red grouper, yellowtail snapper, mutton snapper, um, inside the spas, and the black represents areas that are outside the spas. So the first thing that I want to mention is that all of these long-term monitoring programs were established prior to the implementation of the zoning strategy. So we have really good baseline data of what things look like um, prior to putting this in place. Um, and then most of these are annual surveys. Um, so this, these figures are showing 1994 to 2016. And what you saw is species responded differently. In general, what we saw was initially after um, implementing these spots, we saw a large increase within the protected area of a number of these species. But then you see a lot of fluctuations. And so in some cases, we saw increases both inside and outside. So for instance, for the red grouper and the mutton snapper, whereas we didn't see that at all for the yellowtail snapper, um, we saw this large increase. But then what you also notice is, is there a It's a <laughs> Okay, um, so what you see is this large decline here. And I wanted to point this out because what we saw is there was a really intense period of five or six hurricanes that occurred between 2004 and 2006. And we saw this dramatic decline in um, the density of a lot of these species within the spots. And so that doesn't mean that those fish were killed, but what that means is they were basically exported to the surrounding area. And so there were benefits still to the, to the fishing community in particular about spreading some of these out. Now, I want to just continue on with... Um, another example here, and in this case, there's the black grouper and the hogfish, and this, these figures are showing the um, mean annual abundance of these species. Um, the black, again, refers to outside the protected areas, and the red areas refer to within the protected areas. And so what you see on the, on the x-axis is how common they were um, observed within the stations, and this is the relative abundance of these species. And so you can see for the black grouper, there is a really nice indication that within the spas there was a lot of response. And this also is only for species that are at the legal size of capture. And so what we saw it was a dramatic increase, whereas you don't see that for the hogfish. And um, one of the reasons why we believe this happened is because many of our spas are located in the really high relief habitats, and we know that hogfish tend to occur in some of the high relief habitats, but they tend to like some of the lower relief habitats that are outside of the current protected area. And so this is a really important point for... Um, <coughs> Or, uh, that I'll get to in one second, but I want to just um, show you one more example, and this is talking specifically about non-target species, so species that are not being fished for within the Florida Keys. For many of the really small reef-associated species, we didn't see any differences inside or outside, but there were some that showed quite dramatic um, um, differences. Um, for instance, a lot of the herbivores, like the parrotfish, there were higher abundances um, inside the spas versus outside. But what is really interesting to note is there was a lot more fluctuations. And when we looked more closely at this, what we see is you typically saw when there was one of these large catastrophic events that occurred, whether it be a warm water mass bleaching event, whether it was a hurricane or a cold water event, we saw a dramatic decline in the abundance of these, and then they spiked back up relatively quickly. And one of the reasons I think that you can explain why that occurred is basically after each one of these disturbances, we've lost a lot of coral. And so what that does is that creates a lot more available habitat. Um, by creating more habitat, because corals take a lot longer to grow and recover, what you saw is a lot more algae that ended up um, colonizing those dead corals. And so there's more food resources, and that would really explain why you would see more of these um, parrotfish um, following some of these disturbances. So I want to talk then, before I get into talking specifically about the um, proposed um, changes to some of the zones, is why we see some of these areas performing better than others. Um, I've listed seven reasons here, and I'm not going to really talk about these. 
<laughs> these first three. I'm going to only mention these, these that are related to the um, biological aspects of the species. And the first thing that I want to talk about is the size of the spas and other protected areas that we put in place. There's a general international consensus now that for, for true no-take marine protected areas to um, effectively protect a lot of the, the target species, they should cover somewhere between 20 to 30 percent of all of the marine environment. Well, in our existing strategy, we're only protecting about 5 percent of the habitat. But in addition to that, um, what's really important is that in a lot of cases, these species have a home range. What I mean by that is how far they'll move in a day in an area that is actually much larger than what the protected area is. So if you look at um, this, this is the size of all of the existing protected areas. And this is the, the home range of the five most um, targeted species that are in, in that are reassociated species within the Florida Keys. And you can see for, for every single one of these, except for when you get down to Cary's Fork and Western Sambo, and then in the Tortugas, their home range is actually larger than the area that we're protecting. And so what's happening is these species are spending part of their time inside the protected areas, and then they're swimming outside where they can be targeted. These are all pieces that we've started to address that I'm going to present as I go through some of the different um, alternatives. The other component is that we aren't protecting all of the different habitat types that we use. The bulk of our spas, for instance, are on the outer core reef in that high relief habitat. And so we're not protecting some of the deeper areas, we're not protecting grass beds, hard bottom areas, so on and so forth. And so that is one of the things that we're really trying to get at, and I'll give you examples of that. Um, and, and that falls into this, this fact that, you know, in some cases, maybe the, the juvenile habitat isn't being protected, and so these things aren't able to grow up and reach um, reproductive maturity. And then there's one whole component where we're looking at this resilience question. Um, there has been a lot of loss of habitat here. In particular, if you look at the forest communities, we've lost um, virtually um, most of the elkhorn coral, the spiral coral, which is high relief structure that a lot of these things found refuge under. And so when you lose that habitat, what's been shown in other locations is you see a lot of these species disappear. They have to go somewhere else where they can um, have effective um, refuges that, where they can occur. Okay. By the end, I'll get this to you. Okay, so, so now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna um, talk about some of the biological benefits of some of these different <coughs> zones. And um, the way that I'm going to do this is more or less start in the Tortugas and work my way through the lower keys, middle keys, and um, upper keys with a couple of them that don't fit that exactly. But, okay, so what I want to do is I want to start um, with the Tortugas, as I mentioned. And this is one of the best success stories that I think that there is for marine protected areas around the world. Um, first of all, um, there are three areas that are no-take. There's um, the two areas that are within the sanctuary, Tortugas North Ecological Reserve and Tortugas South Ecological Reserve area up here, and it's all figure you can't see it in this map. And then there is one area that those were first implemented in 2001, and then within the, um, within the National Park, there's a research natural area, which is right here, which was implemented in 2007. And so these are three very large areas, and so they get a first question that these, these MPAs are larger than the home range of most of these species. And what we've seen over time is these have been very, very effective for these fishery targets of increasing um, both the, the density of these species, the abundance, and the size structure um, above that minimum legal size of capture. And to give you an example, this is mud snapper density. And what you can see is data from 1999, it may be hard to see this in the back of the room, but there's um, these sort of white dots, and they don't look white on the screen here for me, but then there's um, a series of red dots, and they get progressively larger in size, which reflects um, a, a higher density of these species. And so you can see, prior to the implementation of these measures, there's only a very few areas where there's high density of these species. They were either absent or at very low levels. But if you look just um, 12 years or so later, what you can see is how much change there has been, both within the protected areas, as well as the spillover that's occurred outside of the areas where they are open to fishing. Um, there's, there was a dramatic response to that. Um, so we know that there's spillover that's occurring. 
The second thing that we've learned from the Tortugas is um, this, these protected areas have worked towards reestablishing some of the fish, the, the important spawning aggregations that are located in deep water. And one in particular is the mutton snapper, which has rebounded quite quickly. Um, um, the spawning aggregation is located in the um, south, um, Tortugas um, South Ecological Reserve, and just off of Riley's Hump. Um, and one of the reasons why this is really important is what we've learned is that um, the bulk of the targeted reef fish species that are found throughout the Florida Keys and southeast Florida inhabit the tortugas. In fact, the tortugas includes about 22% of all the reef habitat um, located within the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary proper. Um, and yet, between 30 to 60% of the population of species that are above the minimum legal size of capture are found within the tortugas. Why is that important? Well, because the tortugas is integrally connected to the rest of the keys. We know from a lot of work that there is a high degree of connectivity between Holy Ridge, the tortugas, and the Florida Keys in Southeast Florida. And this is one example of a study where they looked at these larval drift particles that were released from the tortugas, and they showed that they moved from the tortugas all the way through the Keys and up into Southeast Florida. They did a similar study in Cuba and the Mesoamerican reef system, and what they saw was that within both of those areas, there's a lot more retention. And what I mean by that is these larvae are produced, and only a small proportion of those are leaving and potentially coming to Florida, but most of those are retained in the system. So the tortugas is hugely important for the rest of the Florida Keys because it's providing um, a lot of these fish that they can move into the sanctuary, um, um, into the middle, lower, and upper keys, and settle in those areas, and then support um, fishery species. <coughs> um, so, okay, so, and what we're proposing now are three main um, changes to the tortugas. Um, this is the existing um, zoning and the boundaries, and this is the um, proposed modification. Um, I also didn't mention that I'm only going to be talking about the preferred alternative for all of these, um, these changes that are proposed. And so I want to talk just about these three points. One of the things is to extend the sanctuary boundary, as Kat had indicated, so that it can cover this habitat that is outside. And this really has a lot of benefits for um, the species that occur there, in particular the benthic organisms, because what this would do is it would mean that you have the same anchoring provisions that are within the rest of the sanctuary. And what I mean by that is there's no allowable anchoring on live coral. And there's a lot of coral habitat that's in there. That habitat that is not within the sanctuary is, is connected to other areas, so we're protecting that as well. And also one of the other provisions is there's no um, injury, harm or removal of corals allowed within, the, within sanctuary um, waters, and so that will prevent any sort of damage to the corals that are in that area. The second piece um, that was mentioned earlier today is the proposal to move um, the, the um, ecological, South Ecological Reserve one mile to the west. And the reason why this is really important is since we've been um, doing um, studies um, looking for some of these spawning aggregations, what we've identified is, is at least two more, um, actually three more species, the Kubera snapper, um, the black grouper, and the scamp, have been found to have spawning aggregations right down on the base of Riley's Hump in deeper water. And so by extending the boundary just one mile to the west, we will now protect four different species, the spawning aggregations of four different species. And then the third point is this um, Tortugas Corridor, creating a spot that would connect the um, Tortugas um, Conservation Area South with this, um, with the National Park. Um, and the reason why this is really important is there's been a lot of research done out here um, using these acoustic receivers. Basically, you put a, a tag on a, on a fish, you put these receivers out in different locations, and if the fish swims by that, it will ping, and then it will be recorded on one of these receivers. There are 86 of these that have been deployed around um, the Tortugas, covering an area of about 800 square kilometers. So 
quite an intensive array of these things. And what these have shown is that the mutton snapper that are occurring within this area, that figure that I showed you before, where they've really rebounded, what they do is they migrate from this research natural area into Riley's hump to spawn every time. And so this whole corridor that they were doing, right when these fish are ready to reproduce, was open access to fishing. And by allowing the fish, uh, allowing us to target the fish at the time that they're reproducing, you're hurting um, future generations of these species. And so it's a really, really key area to protect if we want to ensure that there are a snapper to fish in the future. Okay, so I'm going to continue now moving um, to the um, east, and I'm going to only talk about um, one area that's in the Tortugas, and I want to talk about um, this proposed new Marquesas turtle zone. This is a really, really important habitat. It's, um, it's a very dense seagrass bed that's located in the eastern quicksands. It's just west of, of all the, um, the, the, the islands and west of Mooney Harbor. It's right in this area here. Um, this area um, is a really, really important feeding area for turtles. And what's really interesting about this is it's, it's green sea turtles. Um, these turtles um, form the only known large aggregation that's known from anywhere in the southeast U.S. It's only sub-adult and adult turtles. And what's, what's even more interesting is they're the only example where the, the, the turtles form these herds. Large groups of these turtles get together to feed in these particular areas. And so this shows some of the movement patterns of these and locations where high densities of these sub-adult and adult turtles were found. Um, what's even more interesting is this is an area with really, really high tidal flow. And you never see juveniles in there, really. All the juveniles are concentrated in here or in other areas. Um, because this is a known place where a lot of tiger sharks move through and they'll feed on the smaller turtles. And so by them forming these herds, they're able to still feed, they're able to avoid predation pressure, and um, so, so it's a really, really critical to the long-term um, survival of green sea turtle populations. And by establishing this as a wildlife um, uh, management area where we only allow this to be um, a no wake zone, what we're going to really do is, is minimize the disturbances that are associated with boat movements through there and also the likelihood that there are injuries to these turtles as they come from the grass bed up to the surface so that, so that we really reduce um, how many of these turtles die from these, these um, boat incidents. Okay, so one other area that's kind of at the fringe of um, our cases that I want to mention um, is um, Western Dry Rocks. Uh, Western Dry Rocks, so let me just back up for a second. Um, we only started looking at spawning aggregations within the Florida Keys about 2010. So this is, um, a lot of this work was what was started after the condition report, and we've discovered spawning aggregations in deep water that run from Carysport to Western Dry Rocks. Um, Western Dry Rocks is an area, um, and, and there's been several different ways that we found this. One of it is using, again, these acoustic receivers, and what this figure shows is where all the acoustic receivers are, um, have been pushed so, uh, positioned so far, the number of fish have been tagged, again, to see who goes into those particular areas. But there's also been dive surveys done, ROV surveys, there are drop cameras that go in there, um, and then um, all of this information together has helped us identify a number of these new spawning aggregations. And one other piece of information that's been really useful is looking where the heaviest concentration of boats are during the spawning seasons. And so in some cases, that's shown us where some of these aggregations are because there's a lot more fish there. Um, so we know that this area is particularly important because unlike a lot of the other aggregations where we've identified a single species that's, that's, that's occurring there, there are really high densities of several species of snapper, goatfish, permit, and spadefish in the summertime. And then in the wintertime um, spawning season, there's a number of grouper that come into this particular area. But, so, so we want to protect that, but we also recognize that it's a, it's a really, really important fishing area. And so what our proposal is, is that you would only be allowed to troll in this area. And the reason why this can benefit these is if you're not going into an area and anchoring and fishing um, on the bottom or something like that, you're not going to be chumming or you're less likely to be chumming. And if you're fishing with um, 
you know, just by being stationary, you're more likely to pull out a lot of those species that are in those spawning aggregations. Where you're, when you're trolling through, you're still going to be fishing, but you're going to get a lot more of the pelagic species. So it's one way to really start protecting some of those spawning aggregations. Okay, so I'm going to continue now moving, and I want to talk first about Western Sambo. So as you heard earlier this morning, this is the only um, large, contiguous marine protected area currently in place within the Florida Keys that goes from shore out to the reef edge. And I want to talk about why this is really important in terms of lobsters. There's been a lot of research that's shown other factors, but just because of time, I'm going to just talk about um, a couple studies that um, were done by FWC um, on lobster populations. And I first want to just draw your attention to um, the, the two graphs that are on the right. What this shows is the size structure or the age structure <coughs> of um, female lobsters um, outside of Western Dry Rocks in the top and inside of Western Dry Rocks about 10 years after the um, protection was put in place. And what I want, to want you to notice is, first of all, with the current regulations for the uh, minimum size, many of those lobsters are still too small to have reproduced even one time. So we're taking a lot of things that, first of all, haven't reached reproductive maturity, um, or just shortly after. And when you look at outside, what this study showed is only 7% of the population, this, this dotted line indicates the age at which these lobsters first start reproducing. Only 7% of the lobsters in the outside of the population were large enough to be spawning. Whereas within Western Sambo, 45% of the lobsters, and there were some lobsters that were identified that were up to eight and a half years old. So what we know is the larger the lobster is, the more, um, the, the more eggs it will have, so it continues to increase, and so these older lobsters tend to produce many, many more um, offspring when they spawn, and so it's really, really critical to protect those. I want to also then draw your attention to the figure on the right. And what this shows is changes that occur in um, the size of the lobsters, um, looking at three different areas. The dark bars are within Western Sambo. The um, tan bars, or whatever color that is, are within smaller spas or research-only sites. And then the white bars are the size structure outside in the areas that are open to fishing. And so what you can see from here is this dramatic response of how well this marine protected area has worked in terms of protecting the lobsters that are significantly larger within um, Western Sambo than they are anywhere else. There was um, a little but not much response, and I'll talk a little bit about why that is. So the, the, the next thing that um, we needed to understand is, is why do you not see a response in some of the small spots? And what we've learned is that lobsters move a lot. And so the same thing as with the fish, they make their movement every day from where they shelter at night to where they feed in the day. And so in a lot of cases, the lobsters that are even in Western Sambo may go to the outside area and they can be open, open to fishing. We also know that lobsters um, tend to recruit inshore in some of these shallow, in particular the shallow hard bottom areas, they like the sponges to hide underneath those, and then they progressively move out to the reef. Um, so what we what we've learned, they did the same thing as with the fish, is where you put one of these little um, trackers on the lobster, you let it go, and these are what the acoustic receivers look like. You deploy those on the bottom in different areas, and then you can see where they move to. And so, you know, one of the things is these lobsters are moving on a daily basis from their shelter habitat to their feeding habitat, and then returning. The same thing. So this is mid-channel reefs. These are the out reefs. They're doing that same sort of migration. But then we also found that the mid-shelf patch reefs are integrally connected to these offshore locations. And so what happens is the female lobsters in particular will move from this mid-shelf patch reef all the way out to deep water to spawn. Um, the same thing with the ones that are here. They're also moving out to the spawning habitat. Um, and then they spawn and then they move back to where they were originally. And so this is one of the reasons why we're proposing to extend Western Sambo into deeper water. Um, because right now, the time when the lobsters are most vulnerable and when they're most critical to maintaining healthy lobster populations throughout the Florida Keys so that we can continue to harvest these things, 
we need to protect this spawning habitat. So we're proposing to extend this out a little further. Um, the other really important thing about doing this is we've also identified another species, uh, the gray snapper, forms um, spawning aggregations also out on these outlier reefs in a little bit deeper water. Okay, so um, deep water, I'm going to just talk one more, one more slide about um, deep water habitats. So I mentioned the spawning aggregations and I mentioned Kerry Spore 2. This is another area where we have seen um, the current boundary of the spot goes right to here, about the 60 foot contour. And there's been an aggregation site that's been identified just out of that um, in a little deeper water at about 90 feet of a black group. And so that's the only black group or aggregation site that's been identified to date within the Florida Keys problem. Um, so that's a really important area to predict. But I, wanna, I also wanted to mention this figure right here. To date, we've identified 15 different species of, of um, targeted reef fish that are known to form spawning aggregations. And one of the challenges is there's been proposals where we would just do seasonal closures, and that really can't work. Because if you look at this, this is the period when they spawn. And so you can see there's things that start in December, and some of them go all the way up until nearly the end of the year. So basically, there is no period when these fish aren't spawning, and especially if there's multi-species that go into an area, you can't just close it for a while because then other periods they will um, then be targeted. Um, but there's one other really important thing to consider for these deep reef habitats. It's not only for the reef fish. These are really critical habitats for the corals that occur there. Um, we know that there's been a lot of losses of coral that have occurred in shallow habitats, in particular on the um, outer reef system, but we've also learned that some of these deeper reef areas contain unique species of both corals and sponges in some cases, but also some of the same species that you find in shallow water occur in deep water. Some of them may, like this one, this is Orbicella colony, which is one of the most important frame building corals. It looks a little different down deep, but what it does is it plates out instead of forming these big mountains, but it's in effect, it's the same species of coral. And we know that the populations of corals at those depths are much healthier than what you're seeing in shallow, and so there's a refugia there that's really critical. And those, when they then reproduce, their larvae that can go up into shallower water and help reseed some of these areas. Um, in addition, many of the species that you find in deep water, I mentioned that they plate, you also see these certain corals that tend to form these sheets, and shingles in some cases, or just large, what looks like lettuce, big sheets of lettuce, and those are particularly thin and very fragile to anchoring, and so by extending some of these spas out to deeper areas, we will be protecting um, those um, uh, deeper populations of these corals, so it provides a really important refugia. Okay, so I want to now go back to this idea of protecting large, contiguous, interconnected habitats. So we already talked about the, the Sanctuary Advisory Council's goal was to add one area within in the lower keys, upper keys, and middle keys that would extend from the shoreline to deep water. So we already have Western Sandbar in place. And the area that, that Beth had mentioned this morning is, um, is um, an area that extends from Long Key all the way out to, um, to, the, to deep water, so right from here. This is a really, really important area for many reasons. And if you look at this schematic here, so you can think of this being Long Key. First of all, right on shore, there's a, a nice mangrove population. This is an un, undeveloped um, coastal area. There's also a really important sandy area that's an important nesting area for loggerhead turtles. The mangrove habitat provides important nursery habitat for certain species. When you just start to go offshore, there's some nice seagrass beds, and there's really important um, shallow hard bottom habitat that has some of these sponge um, dominated communities that are important for a lot of um, juvenile species. And so we would be encompassing some of those. But then we also get at some of these other um, reef environments. In particular, a number of these reefs, the, the mid-channel hatcheries, have shown you know, really pretty high resilience. They, um, they survive some of these bleaching events. They still have <coughs> populations of a lot of boulder corals. Some of them still have, some areas still have remnant populations of staghorn, things that have disappeared from a lot of other areas. So it's really, really important from the perspective of, of protecting those, those species. And then one other really interesting thing about this area, which I think makes this a really, really good area to put in one of these, is it's 
an area that experiences high flow because it's right near channels on either side. And there's been a lot of research that's shown that there's a lot of juvenile um, lobster, lobster um, nursery habitat um, within this area. And these lobster move through, this is basically a lobster corridor where they go through these um, channels and passes and get out into the reef system. And so by protecting them, we're, we're providing a way where we can have um, these sub-adult populations migrate out towards the reef and reach um, sexual maturity. Um, and so it not only protects those, but also by protecting all these habitats, we're protecting other life stages of a lot of, um, of, of other species of fish and other organisms. And then there's a number of other features in here. There's a lot of um, sand habitats and grass beds that are important for queen pond and other species. Okay, so staying for a second in um, the Middle Keys, I wanted to talk briefly now about two new proposed conservation areas. This is Red Bay Bank and Channel Key Bank. Um, this is just the Google Earth imagery that I downloaded to show you what um, some of the shallow areas in Channel Key Bank look like. These areas are unique from something that currently is not covered at all within any of our um, existing protected areas. Um, what they are is there are these very shallow areas that are these unconsolidated calcium carbonate mountains, basically, that are built largely of, of broken pieces of finger coral rubble and a green top berries algae called halomena that has made these little structures. They provide these very high relief area that supports a large number of species. And what's been found in these areas is that you have many of the same species in on these banks that you also find out in coral habitats. In some cases, they're, they're important nursery areas for certain species. In some cases, they're foraging grounds where the species will move from these particular banks out through some of the passes to seagrass beds, the reef, other areas, and then come back into these, into these particular habitats. So when you look at these banks and you compare them to the surrounding deeper areas, the, the biomass and the diversity of um, reef-associated fish that you find in here, as well as other invertebrates, is much, much higher than anywhere else. And so they're really, really critical, um, um, intricately connected to a lot of the other habitats within the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary. Um, and unfortunately, because of the way they come up so shallow, when you go, actually, you can zoom into Google Earth and some of the um, um, some of the newer imagery that's there, and you can get right in on the top of some of these and see how much prop scarring there is. And so boats really are having a very, very large impact in these particular areas, um, you know, destroying them. And because it's unconsolidated, it's not going to destroy your boat, but you're going to basically ruin this this particular habitat type. And so by establishing these as as conservation areas, we will protect um, critical habitats that. Um, other areas that provide species to other areas throughout the Florida Keys. Okay, so one of the other um, goals that I mentioned early on was to ensure that we identify some of the most resilient reefs and include these in our zoning strategy. So as I mentioned earlier, when you look at where the spas are placed, the vast majority of these are located on the outer floor. This morning, um, when Sarah showed a slide, she said, oh, well, the coral cover um, in the last uh, last published report of coral cover was 6.2% or something like that. It was from 2015. That is taken from the long-term monitoring um, data of the CREP program, the Coral Reef Ecosystem Monitoring Program. They have about 40 stations set up throughout the Keys. Um, when you um, separate that information into the um, both the abundance and, in this case, what I'm showing in this figure here is the richness, the number of species for areas within the spas and outside of the spas. What you see is there's been this dramatic shift to what's happened. So, so it was very true with what, what Sarah had mentioned, where a lot of the spas now on the outside of the reef in particular are down to 1 to 2% coral cover. But we know that a lot of these mid channel catch reefs, as well as some of the inshore areas, still have much higher cover and much higher diversity of corals. You can still find places in the Florida Keys that have 30, 40, <laughs> even, I mean, Chica Rocks, for instance, is an area where there's patches that are 50, 60% living coral cover. So they tend to have survived there for some reason we're starting to learn. It depends on where you are, but they're much more resilient. They've they resisted some of these bleaching events. They may bleach, but the corals have recovered. 
In some cases, they've resisted the disease event. They've done better in response to some of these hurricanes. And what I wanted to point out is what we saw around 2003, I guess that is, was um, traditionally the number of coral species that you would find within these crep stations, within the spas, has declined below what you see in these areas that are not protected. And so this is one example of them. This um, area that we're proposing to protect in East Turtle Shoal is um, a really interesting area because um, it has, it shows a lot of resilience for several reasons. One of them is, is it's not directly connected to Florida Bay water. So we've seen in certain areas that that Florida Bay water can bring a lot of nutrients. There's other problems that may be associated with it. So this is a little sheltered from that. This also includes um, some of these um, um, mid shelf reefs that really are not well represented in the spas. And this is a very, very high relief series of patries, aggregated patries that occur in this area. And there still are um, um, ESA listed corals through here, as well as a number of the other coral species that have you know, virtually disappeared from some reefs from this ongoing um, coral disease event. So, and I wanted to, since I was on turtles, I figured I'd talk about the other turtle rocks. Um, I want to talk just really briefly about um, the proposal for Turtle Rocks. This is another um, very, very resilient um, mid-channel site. And this is a, a little bit of a, a larger area that we're proposing to protect. But this not only includes um, a lot of these really high relief patch reefs, there are seagrass beds in there, there's some hard bottom habitats, so it's, a, it's, it's one way to get at collecting multiple, um, connecting multiple habitat types. Um, there's other benefits to establishing this protection. As was mentioned earlier, this is one of the areas where right now you're not allowed to drop lobster traps, so you're going to minimize the amount of physical impact to some of these. And there's some thought that this may serve as one of these inshore stepping stones. Basically, a lot of species that um, spend part of their life here, they may ultimately move out to the offshore reefs around Cary's port. And so this is sort of an alternative to, in, in um, Alternative four, there was a proposal to have one, um, you know, large contiguous area that went all the way from the shore out to Perry Square. Well, this is one way to, to at least encompass some of that. Um, this area has shown really, really high resilience. Um, this is a picture that Ken just sent me the other day showing um, some of the star coral populations. Um, one of our staff just recently found what I think is one of the largest remaining thickets of staghorn coral um, remaining in um, the Florida Keys, and um, there still are remnant populations of um, Elkhorn coral throughout this area. So really, really important coral to protect because it's highly, highly resilient. And just one other little um, fact about this area. What's really interesting is, is the Elkhorn coral in this area has bleached when there was bleaching events. But what, what is interesting is instead of it dying, it's rebounded and it's come back every time over these multiple bleaching events. So there's something about the site and the corals that are in there that makes it um, very, very resilient. Okay, so um, I think this is the last um, thing that I want to talk about in terms of the, um, the um, zoning strategy. And I just wanted to mention one other, one other aspect. One of the things that's been identified internationally is you can't just have a single spa sitting somewhere out there with anything else. You have to ensure that these are interconnected. And this is mainly because many of the species that occur within these, reef fish, corals, um, a lot of the other invertebrates, they all do this thing called broadcast spawn. And so what you want is when you have these protected areas, when these things spawn, you want to make sure you set these up so that, that these, these particular protected areas may be upstream and those larvae that are carried downstream to some of these other sites so that they can reseed and protect those. And so in a lot of senses, this is the way that, um, that these um, existing protected areas and some of the new measures really um, form this um, network of marine protected areas. And so what this figure shows is the, the boundary of the Key Largo management area. Embedded into this are the alternative three. It includes the existing um, spas that we're not proposing any changes to, as well as if we, if we were to go forward with alternative three, this was two little areas, Grecian and Dry Rocks, that would be a little bit larger, as well as the proposed um, boundary expansion of Carey's Court. So these are all interconnected. We've made some steps to try to increase the size of these so we get more of this issue of ensuring that we cover the whole range of these species and also take into account um, multiple habitat types. 
And I think also when we look at the existing measures that are in place in the Key Largo management area, this is unique um, because it's, it's you know, one of the areas where you can't spearfish right now. Um, there's a prohibition on collecting some of these little things that we don't know a lot about them, but we're starting to learn more and more that some of the little crabs and snails and some of the other things are really important in terms of keeping these ecosystems healthy. And so right now you can't collect any um, um, of these species that, that go into the green ornamental trade for people's aquarium from that particular <coughs> area. Um, and then I'm going to talk about this a little more, but one of the proposals was to make this whole area um, uh, no angering zone. So, so, you know, this is started to get at, at, you know, what we really need to achieve in terms of establishing these networks. And then also it buffers right up against, again, one of these other habitats, Turtle, uh, in the Mitchell area around Turtle rocks. Okay, and so then, sorry, this is the last one about <laughs> the, the spots. I wanted to just end before I talk about, um, real briefly about some regulations, is talking about the four new proposed spas that are um, being proposed in order to protect coral nurseries and also some of these experimental research and restoration locations. So the, um, one of the main reasons to establish this is, is these encompass the largest existing coral nurseries within the Florida Keys. These are really, really important areas. We're trying to minimize the potential of anchor damage, trying to reduce any sort of marine debris impacts in these particular areas. But we also want to make sure that there is the potential for people to see these and understand what's going on and possibly get them more involved in some of the propagation work or maybe it may be as simple as getting you know, people to help keep the um, nursery trees clean. And so that's, that's one of the really important, important reasons for this. The other reason is within all these nurseries, what we're trying to do is we understand that there's each coral, just like people, there's many different genetic colonies or genotypes. So there's many, many different ones of these. And we know that we don't want to take just one genotype and plant it all throughout the keys because it is adapted to certain conditions. And some of these other ones, for instance, may tolerate higher temperatures. One particular strain may tolerate um, disease and other sorts of things. And so we know that we need a lot of these different genotypes. And so we, um, the, all the nursery practitioners have made um, a lot of effort to try to have as many as possible within, within these areas. They're starting to look at what some of their traits are, what makes them unusual. But we also need to ensure that we have replication. Because what happens if we only have one area that's protected for a nursery and a hurricane comes along and destroys that and we lose all those genotypes? In some cases, in these nurseries, certain of these genotypes have disappeared from the wild. The only things we now have are inside these nurseries. And so what we want also is to have all of these areas to serve as these in-water gene banking sites. So basically, every single um, strain of or genotype of Stagnant coral that's in pickles, for instance, would also be in something in the Middle Keys in the Maritime Nursery and would also be in the Key West Nursery so that we have this redundancy and so that we don't lose this important genetic stock. <laughs> and then the other really important component of this is as we're going forward with restoration, um, one of the management actions that we've identified is to look more closely at restoration to figure out how we can scale this up. Florida is a leader, the worldwide leader in restoration where we develop these techniques to propagate these corals. We can plant them out of the corals, but our limitation has been that we're planting things one at a time. It takes a lot of labor, really, really hard. And so we're starting to work on approaches, like for instance, this is one of CRF's new things that they're using bamboo, where they're attaching a whole series of these at once. And you plant this big thing out as one unit so that you can put more coral out at once and restore these habitats much more efficiently and quickly. And so we need a couple sites where we can experiment with what works and what doesn't. We don't want to just go out in any old location and do that. And so a couple of these provide that. And as we move forward with restorations, not just corals we're looking at. We're considering all other species because we know that we need to improve herbivory, for instance. And one way to do that is to put diadema out. And so one of the areas that we've proposed is Delta Shoal, which is a really important area where FWC has done a lot of research on different aspects, both you know, looking at survival of plants, looking at some of this work with these long spine sea urchins, other sorts of things. So we're trying to establish those really to help us move forward. And ultimately, these large regional nurseries will provide a lot of the property that may go to these smaller um, 
uh, localized nurseries or pop-up nurseries or whatever you, that you want to call them that are right next to where some of these larger um, um, demonstration sites end up being that we um, work towards restoring. Okay, so I'm going to uh, really just talk uh, briefly now about four things and then I will stop. Um, the first thing that I wanted to mention is um, fish feeding. And um, so there, there's a lot of scientific studies out there that have shown that feeding a fish, and what I mean by this is just with the intent to attract the wildlife for viewing, is something that changes the behavior of the species. And we also know that it can make them more um, susceptible to predation. It can make them more susceptible to things like injuries from boats because they're going to know a place where they're fed and they're going to all move in when boats come in. And so they may get hit by the props. Um, so we know that, that that is one of the big problems with fish feeding. We also know that it alters the population abundance and structure of those species. And if you suddenly get a lot more of some species that you're targeting by feeding, what that's going to do is it's going to have cascading impacts on the rest of the organisms, on what it feeds on, on what feeds on it. So it really changes the whole dynamics of the reef um, for fishing. And I, I just put this in because I found this on Facebook and I thought this was really pretty interesting. Um, this is word for word what was posted up there. Um, and I was thinking more about the biological aspects, but there is this whole component that a lot of species tend to be more aggressive when you feed them for a while, especially if a diver gets in the water and doesn't feed them. They're going to come up expecting something and they can get very aggressive. So um, that's what I wanted to say about fish feeding. Um, <laughs> I could go on, but I know I'll take it too long here. Um, so the, the next thing that I want to talk about was about um, physical impacts. And so, so, you know, we know that there's a lot of damage from anchoring as well as prop scarring, which I mentioned a little bit. There's um, an increasing number of groundings that occur, and there's impacts, physical impacts associated with marine debris. But I want to specifically talk about anchoring. And so there, there are studies from around the world that have shown that anchoring in coral reef habitats causes a lot of damage. And to give you one example, this is something that just came out about a month ago. This is a study, these four um, figures on the left, is a study from the British Virgin Islands looking at the impacts of anchoring um, in an area. Um, and what they showed was, um, basically what this is showing is, this is areas where there's low amount of anchoring, medium, high amount of anchoring. And what they showed in all the categories that they looked, looked at is there was lower coral cover in areas where there's a lot of anchoring, the size of the corals that were in those habitats were smaller, the, the density of the corals was lower, and then they even were able to go one step further and show that those changes that occurred in response to anchoring causes a decline in the density of fish within those areas. And this was, regardless of whether there were moorings in place or not, it was just looking at how intense the amount of anchoring is. I put in um, three studies from the Florida Keys. One of the oldest ones that I was able to find was a study that looked at, there, there are these extensive areas of stack on coral out in the Tortugas, and they found that, so this is old, this is before any of the management plans were put in place, but anchoring destroyed 20% of the staghorn thickets out in that particular area in this study. Um, there was uh, a study done in 1987 looking in the upper keys um, on some of the high-use reefs. And so what they showed was that there was a much higher frequency of broken corals in areas where um, there was more anchoring going on. And then there was a more recent study looking at this lobster mini season. And so they looked at all these sites, and out of the sites that they looked at where they saw a lot of boats, 60% of the sites had anchor damage during the lobster season. So a short little window, quite dramatic. And then there's been a lot of anecdotal reports that I've heard since I've been here that um, folks that are going out and removing marine debris, in some cases, they're removing more anchors from these hard bottom and coral habitats than they are other types of marine debris. So it's, it's, it's you know, quite, quite substantial, the um, impacts that are occurring. And so I wanted to just talk a little bit about um, some of the strategies that we have in place. Um, this is something that I photographed just a month ago or so. Um, one of our few big, beautiful corals. This is something that Dana Williams provided me, and this was one of the reasons why she used this actually to go forward trying to address trapping, and, and that was one of the reasons why trapping is limited, just um, you know, because a lot of stuff gets wrapped around it. 
But so what we have right now to address this is sanctuary wide. Um, the, the provisions, the way I understand it, is if you're in water that's 40 feet deep or less, you cannot anchor on live coral if you can see the bottom. Um, we also have made a really, really um, large effort to put in mooring balls, which has had a measurable benefit in terms of reducing anchoring. There are also some particular sensitive areas um, where um, alcorn coral and staghorn coral were known to occur, where you can't drop traps there because that was found to cause a lot of damage to those. Um, in our some existing measures and also in a number of our new ones, what we're proposing in some cases is either requiring idle speed or no weight, um, really to reduce the likelihood of direct contacts with the boat. To these things. But, but the way that we're really proposing to get at this anchor issue is we propose that there would be no anchoring in the spas at all, um, as well as the conservation areas in those two bigger areas in Blue Key and Key Largo. And I know that there's probably going to be a lot of opposition, and I think it'd be really great to have comments on other ways to approach this. But, but given the fact that there's um, so little coral left here, we're trying to recover these corals. And for instance, if you throw an anchor in a hard bottom habitat, what's typically going to happen is that anchor is going to drag along the bottom until it runs into a coral or something else that I can hook on. And the amount of damage that that's doing, I think, is no longer really acceptable. And so we need to come up with a reasonable solution to try to mitigate some of the damage from, um, from anchoring um, so that we can really be successful in recovering these um, the coral populations. And Okay, and so my last thing that I want to talk about is about carrying capacity. And so um, what we know is that um, within the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary, we have to balance conservation with sustainable use. It's really important to ensure that the activities are both ecologically sustainable as well as socially sustainable. Um, so there's a lot of examples from around the world where you can um, find out that overuse of particular habitats has led to degradation of those habitats, not, not just in the water, uh, on land as well. And at some point, that use will exceed the ability of the system to recover. Now, what's important to also know is that the carrying capacity of the system is really variable depending on where you are and what you're looking at. So for instance, for reefs, it depends on a lot on the size of that reef, the shape of the reef. It depends on the type of corals that are present in that particular area. It depends on the environmental conditions. So for instance, if you have people snorkeling in an area that's 20 feet deep, and that's all they're doing is snorkeling, they're likely to have very minimal impacts. Whereas if it's one to two feet, and it's, it's full of elkhorn coral thickets, you're going to have a lot more impacts when you put too many people in that particular area. And then it also depends on how accessible the site is and finally how attractive it is. So what I've seen in a lot of places that I've gone is, for instance, whale sharks are a really good example. I've been to a couple places where whale sharks aggregate. And what happens is because there's such a small restricted area, when, when the Maldives is a really good example, they only have one location where these whale sharks occur. And so one boat operator will go in and he'll have 50 to 100 snorkelers that jump in the water. There'll only be a couple whale sharks there. The minute he sees that, he calls all the other operators and everyone comes in. And what they've seen is that by putting too many people in the water, it's actually chasing these whale sharks away. And so the more attractive this resource is, the more people you're going to have to want to go to that area. And the more critical it becomes to um, ensure that you address that problem. So not an easy problem to address. Um, so when we look back to when we first put the spas in place, one of the main reasons for doing that was to de-conflict um, conflicts between different user groups. One of the things that that did do is it then, in areas where they're diving, it reduced the number of people there, potentially, if you will, because there's no one fishing anymore in that area. But what we've done in effect is we've taken the most iconic reef sites throughout the Florida Keys, and we put in all these boring buoys, and we've concentrated all this effort within these very, very small areas. And so that's the bulk of the place where people go. There's more people going to other areas now, and there are other areas as well. But we've really concentrated this together um, in, a, in a very small area. And so there was a recommendation that came out of one of the working groups um, within the Sanctuary Advisory Council 
um, that led us to this approach to identify three locations, one in the middle, one in the, one in the upper middle and lower keys, where we would test this idea of carrying capacity and try to figure out how can we reduce how many people are going to these particular areas. So it's really challenging. It's like, how do you say who can go there and who can't? Um, you know, if we say that um, no tourists can go into that area, well, then you're hurting the people that rely on the tourists for, for revenue. Um, you, so you have to really think about how to do this. And so we've come up with one proposal, but it may not be the best proposal. And what I wanted to do is give you a list of things that I've seen in other places that I've been in coral reef environments around the world. And ways that these, this problem has been addressed range in everything from closing either a certain portion of the reef or closing an area seasonally, limiting the size of the groups that can go in there, um, requiring guides that, that have to go with the groups so that they can sort of monitor their activities and ensure that they don't do damage, limiting the type of activities that can occur in an area. Um, one of the things that's become very, very popular in, in many locations around the world is creating these little tags that you have to buy. So an entry fee, so the only people that are buying those tags can go into those particular areas. And that not only has the benefit of, of reducing how many people are going to go in there, if you then take that funding and use it for conservation activities, you have a secondary benefit to it. Um, and then one of the strategies that we've talked about internally, that this is something that's used in Bonaire, for instance, is they rotate their mooring balls. So they have 50 mooring balls in an area, for instance, and only 20 of these will be in place for a year, a couple of years. And then they take those out, and then they do another area. And so you're spreading this out over a larger area. So this is something that we really need, I think, a lot of help. I think this is something that would really help to have um, public input on what is the best way um, forward to um, really try to get at this carrying capacity um, that's I'll say that. And so I just want to end with just one last thing. Um, I, I, I want to first acknowledge um, there's lots and lots of people that have done research and help, but I wanted to just acknowledge um, some of the really um, um, large groups that have done bulk of the research that I presented here today. Without all the partners, um, the sanctuary is really big, it's really complex. There's It's going to be a long, hard process, and not everyone's going to be happy with every step, but it's 
it's going to help everyone in the long run, I think, to do that. And that's what I want. <laughs>
Now, so I've described the layer of the varieties of permitting that's applicable to federal and state waters. Within the state waters, as a result of the expiration of that programmatic agreement, you would be required to also secure a permit from Florida's Division of Historical Resources. Florida's Administrative Code, uh, FAC 1832, sets out a process by which you can apply to archaeological research on state bottom lands. In addition to that, Florida Administrative Code 1846 sets out the historical reform standards and guidelines whereby you would report on the activities that they're undertaking under that permit. <clears throat> One of the Florida's Administrative Codes relating to cultural resources that does not apply to Florida East National Land Sanctuary is 1831, which is the procedures for conducting exploration and salvage and exploration of sites. This particular <coughs> regime is not applicable to Florida East National Land Sanctuary. So what you can see here is quite a mass of different permitting regulations here that makes it difficult for our uh, sanctuary researchers to secure sort of permits that they are interested in to be able to reveal the history of the Florida Keys. So taking the basis that 60% of Florida Keys National Sanctuary is state waters on which the state holds title to the historical resources, and the state actually owns those resources as primacy, that historical resource permits and activities often occur in both federal and state waters. We have a scenario where we're requiring multiple varieties of permit to do particular research activity. And I have been uh, had many conversations with permittees who have expressed uh, <laughs> challenges with navigating the system and uh, expressed some serious frustration for not being able to do the kind of research that they would want to carry out. So as I mentioned, the previous programmatic agreement has expired, and so this that agreement had essentially set out a path forward for dealing with some of these uh, different permit regimes. And since of the expiration of that permit, or of that programmatic agreement, we have not been able to have a consistent means to permit archaeological research in the sanctuary. And finally, the Florida East National Sanctuary decession and transfer permits have never been used since the Transfer Division back in 1997. And as the sanctuary system has evolved and we've become more knowledgeable of the sanctuary, uh, sanctuary's role in historic preservation, we've also determined that these sorts of permits which allow for individuals to keep what is the common cultural heritage of the sanctuary are not um, consistent with the federal archaeological program, which is a series of laws that specify how the federal government is supposed to be treating historic objects, artifacts, and archaeological sites. So to deal with uh, these variations and to set a path forward that is streamlined and makes the most sense, I believe, uh, and addresses the needs of our permittees as well as the needs of the sanctuary to serve these resources. I propose, and this plan proposes, that we eliminate this multiple categories of survey inventory, research recovery, and the accession transfer permits. And that we adopt a single archaeological research permit category following along the lines of the 1A32 permit that is authorized by the state of Florida. In conjunction with that, the proposal that we put before you includes a pro the new programmatic agreement which specifies how Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary operations, management, and permitting will be carried forward. It is not exactly the same programmatic agreement that was previously used to handle this. There are new requirements and new obligations at all of the parties for NOAA, the Advisory Council on Historic Preservation, and the state of Florida uh, are trying to answer through this programmatic agreement. But the combination of these changes that are proposed in the plan, I believe, sets forward a new path that will simplify 
as well as continue the protection of these non-renewable sites. You'll see in Appendix C of the Restoration Blueprint uh, details about this program agreement. It sets forth a path that is focused on NOAA's obligations under Section 106 of the National Historic Preservation Act. Section 106 requires that federal agencies take into account their effects on the undertakings, the things that sanctuaries do, whether they be the operations of the sanctuary, installing mooring buoys, as well as the permitting that we undertake. Through this program agreement, we specify a streamlined pathway that allows NOAA to meet its historic preservation mandates and meet the requirements of Section 106 in a more direct fashion and <coughs> continues this process of historic preservation in a facilitated manner. It also details the process to allow certain historical resource permits to be issued to facilitate co-management of these resources, whether they be in sanctuary federal waters or sanctuary state waters. As a result of all of the management and regulatory activities that are being proposed through this restoration blueprint, uh, we believe that the historic preservation of the sanctuary will be greatly facilitated. In situations where we are expanding the boundary, there will be additional historical and cultural resources that are going to be protected by sanctuary regulations. Sanctuary-wide regulations will increase the efficiency, what I'm proposing here, will increase the efficiency of the permitting process and improve resource protection and reporting by having a consistent reporting standard that is in place for both state and federal waters. An effect uh, on some of our permittees may result. Currently, we have seven historical and cultural resource permits that are issued to six permittees. Some of the permittees may need to modify their research plans to be able to qualify to continue the research they're doing. But I don't believe that any of the permittees would be excluded from uh, being able to continue their research. Now, as a result of the differences in marine zones that have all been presented here, the different varieties, regulatory changes expand the marine zones or limit the allowable activities also protect the historical and cultural resources in those zones, whether they be protection from grounding or anchoring damage. So together, in combination with the historical resources regulatory changes, boundary expansion, and the changes in marine zones, I believe that the plan that we have proposed to you here has uh, an overall significant net uh, increase in historic preservation opportunities for the sanctuary. Uh, we are very interested in hearing how folks feel about these changes and whether or not they will continue to be able to conduct the research that they uh, are interested in conducting and whether we are doing what we need to do to protect these non renewable resources for current and future generations. Thank you very much.
were getting messages left and right, but now there's get stuff ready, get stuff ready. By Tuesday, for all the memos and PowerPoints, we're going to be
you could just like put a card in and press the card in. Barely. Do what? Uh, just like swap the card. Oh, it had to be a whole process. Well, you don't want to like damage its memory. You know, it's like it's like not safely ejecting your hard drive. Right. Well, that's what I'm saying. That's what I just. That's what I just <laughs> you had to safely eject it. No, I didn't. Oh.
uh, could be. Um, for consumptive recreation, recreational fishing would be the example of ecosystem service within this category. We also have non-consumptive recreation, which includes diving and snorkeling, but also uh, stand-up paddle boarding, kayaking, wildlife viewing. A food supply, uh, which would be commercial fishing, and then other values like education, um, which could be improved experiences with the visitor center. Um, Matt talked about um, American heritage resources, so if we learn more, if we protect them, that might increase um, the access and the opportunities that people have to learn about those resources and improve the benefit um, that people receive from the environment. Um, the other reason the ecosystem services are important and why we frame it is that when the quality or the quantity of the resources improves or decline, it also impacts how humans benefit from the resource. But not only that, what's also relevant today in um, the conversation of different zones is that as access changes to the resources, those benefits might improve um, or increase or decrease for various groups of people. So we'll be talking about that. Uh, for the analysis, uh, what we're doing, and it's important, I think, to talk about what this analysis includes and what it doesn't. Um, for each regulation and for each alternative, and I'm only focusing today on alternative three, the preferred alternative, we do cover the benefits, we do analyze the benefits, the costs, and the benefits of each um, alternative and each um, regulation or change or change within each alternative. The analysis is quantitative when possible, but if we don't have generic data, then we do provide a qualitative analysis of the regulations. And then all numbers in terms of cost uh, represent the maximum potential loss. So the assumption for the numbers that I present later on in the presentation <coughs> is that that activity is completely lost. It's not um, displaced or moved outside of the zone. Um, it is, is simply removed uh, permanently the assumption that we make for these numbers. And I'll, take, I'll talk later on about um, whether or not that's a realistic assumption. Uh, so for the process, I think it's important to mention some of our key partners uh, that we worked with on this analysis. Uh, the NOAA's National Center for Coastal and Ocean Science, the University of Miami uh, Erasmus, and then the NOAA's Integrated uh, Ecosystem Assessment. Uh, for the different data sources, this is just some of the primary data sources. There was other data utilized um, in our analysis, but to point out some of the um, Florida Official Wildlife Conservation Commission, uh, Florida Department of Environmental Protection, the Bait Fish uh, Permit Database of the Sanctuary, Monroe County uh, Tourist Development Council, and then for recreational fishing, the No Fisheries Marine Recreational uh, Fishing Statistics Program. So jumping into the analysis, we'll first start with the sanctuary-wide regulations. Uh, for alternative one, the no action, the way we talk about benefits and costs for this, the benefits are going to be the avoided costs of not adapting alternatives two, three, and four. Whereas the costs are the lost benefits given up by not adapting the alternatives. So when I talk about the benefits and costs of alternative three, in this context, the benefits and costs of alternative one would be inverse. What we are not doing here, uh, looking at the um, cost of the no action, where the management stays the same, we're not looking at an analysis of how those ecosystem services, how the economy would be affected um, by the resources um, continuing on their trajectory that they're on and or declining as a result of um, no change in management. So for the sanctuary-wide regulations, uh, the first one is the limit uh, discharge for cruise ships in the sanctuary. So we expect in terms of benefits, uh, the improvement of water quality as a result of this regulation. And this would help to support uh, tourism, and recreation, and other water-based activities, and support um, water quality for habitat for commercial and recreational fishing. The cost would be minimal as the cruise ships can still discharge 
the, the proper process. And if that were to occur, then there would be an economic analysis of that regulation done at that point. Uh, the third is to align the more coordinated regulations with those of the Florida Department of State Vision and Historical Resources. Again, for benefits, we would expect to see expanded protection of historical resources um, that will result um, in the benefits that people receive. And that, I've talked about some of them in terms of the educational experience that, is, that people might receive in protecting these uh, non-renewable resources. Um, the cost would be expected to decline over time of the more direct and streamlined permitting process. Um, the ability to address the impact from derelict or um, abandoned vessels. So past studies have shown, and, and I'm sure we know that from experience, that the damage from derelict and um, abandoned vessels can accumulate um, and you know, cost millions of, of dollars. Um, these regulations will help to minimize these damages. And for costs, will be relatively um, small when compared to the liability someone might face of leaving a vessel abandoned Um, for prohibiting fish eating, um, the benefits we would expect this to be a somewhat smaller since there's very few operators that engage in this practice. Um, overall, the cost would be low, but we do um, we do realize that for the businesses that would be affected, the cost to that individual business might be high. Uh, for more really restrictions, um, we would expect to see the, the benefits from, uh, control, um, from helping the vessels to reduce their anchoring and things like that, or the cost might be the, the actual implementation of the buoys. Um, and then for uh, bait fishing, the benefits would be the avoided uh, administrative uh, cost of permit issuing from the elimination of bait fishing. And the cost would be to purchase the bait for the fishermen that would then them purchase the bait or uh, travel further offshore or further around um, to catch the bait that they would need. For alternatives for um, oh, the, the two um, options that are for alternative for only one is to require the sanctuary authorization for live rock aquaculture. Um, the benefits would be the avoidance of unauthorized activity. And then we would expect to be the cost that would be fairly minimum since they already need to fill out a, a permit for the state. There would just be some additional paperwork required um, by the sanctuary. And then the limit the boat speed within 100 yards of all shoreline. Um, for this, we would expect to see increased um, uh, public safety, um, increased benefits in terms of wildlife, reduced shoreline erosion, and we would expect the cost to be minimal. So now, um, the majority of my time, I'll spend talking about the um, marine zone boundaries um, and those changes and um, each of the alternatives. First, though, I'm going to get uh, super technical and, and break out a bunch of econ jargon um, and define um, the different terminology and what I mean by that. Um, so that we're all on the same page or slide uh, going forward. <laughs> that activity. 
Income is the total value paid to workers, and it includes proprietor or business owner income. <coughs> jobs are the sum of full-time and part-time and seasonal jobs. Uh, so for example, just to, to be super specific here, when we talk about jobs, if there are is a seasonal job that's in the summer season, and then a seasonal job in the winter season, um, that, may, that would be perhaps two separate jobs the way that some people think about it. But in the numbers that I'm presenting, each of those seasons becomes a half of the job, right? It's six months. Um, and that would equate to one job in the numbers. <laughs> Um, and then person days, um, so one person day of fishing or um, non-consumptive recreation or whatever the activity is that we're looking at, um, and this will be a full or any part of the day. So if I spend three hours to go scuba diving, that would count as one person day of scuba diving. Alternatively, if I were to go out on a Monday and stay overnight and fish on both Monday and Tuesday, that would count as two person days of fishing. Um, so we'll start with commercial fishing and we'll go for the methodology and then um, I'll present the results. Uh, for this, the partnerships we worked with is, uh, was MCOS and then Horizon South, like the University of Miami Rice also um, provided an analysis. So the data, we used the best available data that we had available to us, which is based upon the statistical areas used by the Fish and Wildlife Research Institute, of, um, and this data was for commercial fisheries. Um, we have towns and value of revenue available to us by again these statistical areas. And there's 12 different statistical areas um, that overlay the, the Florida Keys um, National Sanctuary boundaries. Um, and we just want to point out that the data is not of a fine enough spatial resolution to analyze the individual zones. So we can't look at how we you know, create a spot or change spots from a spots of conservation area, we're not able to look at that. We don't have that level of fine scale spatial resolution. But we are able to present are the overall impacts of alternative two, three, and four. And again, we're just presenting alternative three here today. Um, so the estimates um, are also by industry, and they do not represent how one individual business may be impacted more or less relative to um, their policy. So for reef uh, fish and lobster, we looked at nine different reef fish that make up about roughly 90% of the total catch of reef fish in the sanctuary, um, and then lobster. So we have the habitat species relationships that were provided to us by the University of Miami Rasmus, and this tells us where we are most likely to find a given species. Um, for the lobster, those habitat species relationships were provided by FWR. in terms 
of the stone cap, so we assumed uh, equal distribution of that catch, which is reported on the trip tickets, across the statistical areas. So there is a greater uncertainty um, in these estimates in regards to maximum potential loss. So what we find for alternative three, and these are costs um, or loss, is that the loss of harvest revenue is about $600,000. And this is uh, roughly 1% of the control totals for what was caught in these statistical areas that we're looking at. So this is not, the 1% is not a percentage of the total catch landed in Monroe County. It is what is caught in the 12 statistical areas um, that we overlay the data with. Income is about 650,000 um, in terms of loss and 15 jobs. This, again, does not represent loss to the individual but this takes into account as, a, as the catch is um, brought to shore, how it's been sold to restaurants, fish processing, um, whoever it may be sold to, and how that impact also trickles through the economy in terms of the loss. So moving on to recreational fishing, again, we worked with um, any class in the Miami University of Miami residents. Uh, we used the best available data, which was also for the large nas national statistical areas. Um, and this in our data um, for catch was from the uh, NOAA fisheries. Um, and we used the same ex um, accepted approach that's been used in the past um, to overlay you know, habitat, or not habitat, um, the, the person days and activity. Um, we don't have a final spatial scale resolution of data. So for refish, um, University of Miami, they developed estimates of recreational effort by person days for refish by gear type and by mode of access. Um, and then we also have the control total measured as person days for the, um, for no fisheries for those 12 statistical areas. And then we have spending estimates that were from past studies that NOAA had done um, in terms of recreational fishing and the amount that um, visitors and residents spend um, to engage in this activity. Uh, for recreational uh, fishing for, or for the spiny lobster, um, the, the FWRI provided spiny lobster um, fishing effort. And we have control totals of person days within the statistical areas and uh, and cost use these person days to distribute across the habitat type. And then again, our spending estimates are from previous studies. So looking at the cost um, here, it's slightly, you know, it's higher for recreational fishing um, in terms of the impacts. So when we talk about loss, it's a loss of $13 million in terms of spending. So what people are spending to engage in recreational in the lobster season. Um, and then income is 14.6 million, or sorry, output is 14.6 million, income is 6.8 million, and jobs uh, will be about 40 jobs in terms of loss. So the third uh, category of, of use that we consider is non consumptive recreation. Um, this is recreation such as snorkeling, diving, wildlife viewing. So these 
sort of benefits here and not costs. <coughs> so alternative three, the, we would expect the benefit um, in terms of spending to see roughly an increase of $30 million in spending into the number of <coughs> The output would be a $34 million increase in output. Um, income would be about $15 million, and then we would expect to see um, 420 jobs supported by the regulatory changes under alternative three. So if we were to look at this all together in terms of net benefits, so accounting for the benefits <coughs> and the costs, we have an output of roughly um, 18 um, million, actually, sorry, it would be about 22.6 million. Uh, the income would be 9.3 million. And then jobs would be a net gain of about 420, 420. So I apologize, these numbers are not correct, but that's what they said on the video on the website. The last category I want to talk about is non market valuation. So this is in, um, in terms of jobs or output or GDP. Um, it's more abstract concepts to some, um, but many people have value for resources even if you're not using them. Um, and even if you use the resource, you may have a value above and beyond what you pay to actually access the resource. Um, and the value may increase or decrease as the access uh, to the resource increases or decreases, and as the uh, quantity and quality of that resource this is what um, us economists would call consumer surplus. Um, so, more economic jargon for you. Um, under alternative three, we would expect to see about a gain of $15 million in non market valuation. So, there would be some um, loss of non market value for recreational fishermen as the number of days might decline. <coughs> but then we might also see um, an increase in non market value for the non competitive users and for also people who may never come for a case, but still have a value and still have a willingness to pay to know that um, these resources are protected in a sustainable way. Um, so, before I get uh, to the summary, in regards to the, the cost, I have presented the cost for recreational and um, commercial. <coughs> Um, one thing I want to mention is that that is what we estimated. In reality, though, we would not expect to see the loss of that, a loss of that magnitude. Um, in past studies um, that we've done for the Channel Islands Marine Reserve process, we found 10 years later there was no impact. Andy earlier talked about the likelihood of spillover effects as a result of protecting areas and closing them off to fishing. So, although that is the maximum potential loss that I presented, it is likely that fishermen may be able to substitute or relocate <coughs> to a different place and still have or be able to catch the same amount. Or if we see spillover, spillover effects as a result of protecting different areas, um, they would hopefully still have the same catch. This isn't something we can uh, necessarily quantify at this point, right? It requires monitoring. Um, and to be able to, to follow um, what is occurring in the economy. So to review, we analyzed the impacts of ecosystem services in, in the sanctuary as a result of the restoration movement. So we talked about how there might be some loss in terms of services as a result of less access for um, various fishing activities. But then we also talked about how we would expect to see benefits accruing to non-consumptive users. And in the long run, um, we would expect, hopefully, to see no loss to commercial and recreational fishermen as a result of the spillover effect and the habitat, the water quality, and the fish stocks um, improving um, from the restoration movement. Um, we talked about some economic jargon. Uh, we looked at uh, sanctuary-wide regulations. Overall, we're finding net benefits will accrue in each alternative. Uh, the improvements to resources result in increased environmental health um, and improvements to ecosystem services. So as the environment improves, so do the ecosystem services and the way that people can benefit from those resources. And then we also considered the marine zone regulations and found that overall there are net benefits um, accruing in each alternative. So again, I didn't really, um, discuss alternatives two and four here, but um, we did 
did find that benefits in, in every alternative um, analyzed. There are costs to the recreational and commercial <coughs> instrument where the benefits accrue more on the non-consumptive users and the non-market value. <coughs> I do want to emphasize that in the long run, we would expect these costs to fishermen um, to, to decline and, and perhaps hopefully to zero out as we have spillover effects and those resources begin to improve. Um, so all costs represent the maximum potential loss. We're not taking into account the fact that um, fishermen may uh, relocate um, to areas outside of the, the zones where fishing may become, uh, would be prohibited. We're not considering that. We're also not considering <coughs> the fact that um, stocks may improve as a result of the restoration blueprint, which would allow um, there to be more fish to be fished. Um, and all activity, again, so this is just that all that activity would be lost. It would not be relocated, there would be no substitution, and there would be no spillover effects. That is what we're assuming when we talk about the costs. Uh, the results do not address how the individual person or the individual um, business may be impacted. So these are aggregate numbers, and we do not have information for how the individual might be impacted, um, but we, we are want to know how you, know, you would feel, I'm sure you will be letting us know, um, and we will take that you know, into consideration. That's why we're here, that's why we have several days, or several months for public comment and many different um, public information sessions. Um, we do find that the alternatives offer net benefits.
about this morning, the condition report was really one of the triggers, the impetus to begin this review. Lots of advisory council engagement, community engagement through this process. Uh, the agency and partners taking all that information and translating it into the document that we have released for public comment today. And then following public comment, an AG, agency review of that comment, putting out a proposed draft rule that will then have a public comment. So this is one step in that process of, of more public input for how we may update the management of the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary. And the next steps include more opportunity with this body, public comment, as well as the agency's responsibilities to coordinate with our state partners, DEP, FWC, as well as our own agency partners, National Marine Fishery Service, and both the South Atlantic and Gulf of Mexico Fishery Management Council. So we'll be working a lot at interagency as well as public and community engagement. So this is not really what I want to show you, but this is the steps of regulations.gov. And I'm going to take you to our website, hopefully. Okay. So here is that page devoted to the restoration blueprint. And right now, to find regulations.gov, it is at the bottom. Um, but we're going to try and make it a little bit more accessible for the public to get right to that. And you will click on this link. It will take you to regulations.gov. I'm just going to copy this docket number here. Here I am at regulations.gov. In the search box, I will put that docket number. Maybe without the page. Search. And here is the draft document where you can hit this button, comment now. So public comments starting today, if you would like to submit public comment, but we have public comment open through January 31st, so you can come to additional listening sessions, uh, ask more questions, get more involved, public comment open through regulations.gov till January 31st. Sarah Fagan is going to wrap up our restoration blueprint presentations.
reveal itself in this process. I know that we aren't all going to agree. I know that we need to, to work to make this even better. That said, I hope we can do that productively. I hope we can do that through listening and really respecting where everyone is coming from and trying to find that common solution that we can all get behind. We, we don't have many opportunities like this. It has taken us nearly 10 years to get here. And so we cannot waste what we have done. And then I just want to leave you with one thought that really um, speaks to me and inspires me as, as I work with you all on this. And some of you have heard me tell this story. But a few months ago, I had the opportunity to meet with a, a few new divers, relatively new divers. They happened to be all girls. They were between ages 13 and 16. And they had been diving each of these for one to two, maybe three years. These girls told me how in their short time diving in the Florida Keys, they had seen declines on these resources. I can accept that I, at 50, have seen declines. I've been diving in these resources for the Keys for close to 20 years. And I've seen changes. I can accept that in that amount of time, that's possible. I cannot accept that for young divers who are just learning to dive and have only been doing it for a couple of years can bear witness to declines. And so my hope is that in this process, and it will take time to get through this process, and then it will take time for us to see the benefits of what we achieve. But my hope is that girls like these that I heard from will bear witness when they're at my stage in life. They will bear witness not to the decline, but that we did something about it. We can turn it around and then we made it. That's right. So thank you.
So it's important to wait uh, for a microphone. We're going to bring the discussion back to you to see for the council members to share some of the concerns, questions, uh, comments that they may have. Um, so when you do get the microphone, you can also state the name of your constituency, the interests that you represent. Uh, and again, just, just know that there's likely going to be a lot more questions than we have uh, time for today. Uh, we'll do our best to address all these questions, but again, in our future meetings, there will be an ample opportunity for everybody to express their concerns and comments. Uh, so with that, we can open it up to the SAC for any questions or comments. This is Gina. Gina.
that basically that is the intent of that regulation, but as we develop the final um, definition of regulations, depending upon what is implemented, those would have to be developed. But it is, it's, we've heard a lot of presentations leading up to this about how important the question of drought rocks was as a multi species aggregation spot. Uh, and then to kind of be left uh, today with a somewhat obscure, undefined uh, you know, zone here, uh, which was presented to us as an incredibly important one. Uh, I just think that you know, more could have been done, and I would like to hear a, a rock solid definition of exactly what trolling is and how it's intended to you know, protect spawning aggregations uh, up there. Uh, and I've had another follow-up, um, <clears throat> just a general thing that we didn't hear anything about here was about uh, law enforcement, and it was something that I heard at every single one of the roundtables and in every single discussion that I've had with just about every single person uh, on how we intend to, you know, address uh, this increase in zones and increase in management and all of the robust work that we want to do, uh, and I just, you know, haven't heard anything about you know, how we intend to address the real needs of law enforcement communities and, you know, how we intend to have a culture of knowledge being passed down from, you know, generation to generation. So I, I don't, I know that today's meeting perhaps was just putting out the maps and not addressing some of those internal issues, uh, but just wanted to know if those are going to be issues that we're going to deal with perhaps at a later SAC meeting where we kind of discuss the nuts and bolts of everything that we want to do that we've heard about today with what we can actually do, you know, with regards to law enforcement, some signs, and just money in general, uh, I guess. Um, and that's that going to happen? That, that was briefly touched on this morning in, in discussions about the management plan. So one of the activities within the management plan is, is to, to work on increasing and addressing the enforcement issues that we do have down here in the Keys. is something that we've been working on every day trying to, to improve that. Um,
both uh, uh, management as well as looking into uh, potentials of you know, different areas for zonation, maybe a little lacking in the actual restoration part. So maybe the, the name of uh, blueprint for restoration is blueprint for management and zoning, but we need to maybe crank up the restoration part. Thank you, David. Yes, Karen. Well, I've got one up here. <laughs> Uh, Chris Burr, Conservation and Environment, C202. Uh, this question uh, was in my mind and others in the audience asked it. The new zones uh, focus on the coral nurseries. Do those cover just the coral nursery or also contiguous uh, or bottom or coral reef habitat? And uh, I'll take my answer off here. But congratulations to all of you for getting this thing out the door. Thank you. Yes, so it's the coral nurseries and the far bottom that's surrounded by them. For instance, Pickles Reef covers the, the whole nursery area as well as the, the far bottom area where a lot of the um, experiments are happening right now is going on. And when we were talking, oh, sorry, Carathor and the boating industry, when we were talking about derelict vessels, you used the phrase becoming derelict. And how do we qualify that so it's not just someone's opinion? So that, that specific regulation is based on us trying to become consistent with not only the state of Florida and their Daryl Vessel program, but also other national sanctuary sites. And so recently, so the last year, Captain, the at risk, at risk yes. so the, the state of Florida passed a law uh, that identifies certain criteria that a vessel can meet to become designated as at risk of becoming a parallel vessel, and that is a violation of your state statute. So we're looking to bring our regulations to be consistent with the state so that we can actually take an action to possibly prevent something from becoming derelict without having to impact resources. And just on that, um, where we reference that we're trying to align our proposed um, our proposals with something that may exist in the state regulations and in state waters. In the document, the state uh, regulation is referenced. So um, either some is excerpted in the document or the um, actual regulation is referenced. So you can find information there as well. And I too had um, several people ask about more involves. And I think it would be great if we added more, but I think it's also important to bring public that those are being rotated and we're going to do more research to make sure the areas where the wind balls are now aren't suffering more degradation. Is that fair to say to people? So the proposals in the, in the restoration blueprint and in the management plan section there are elements related to our marine boy program um, and how we may change or implement based on what the final proposal is. Um, and so I would encourage people to go to that section to look at what the full scope of mooring buoy sort of proposals and activities are and to provide comment about ideas on what we proposed as well as additional um, input for us to consider. And then one more thing about the mooring balls. Um, a couple of people asked why we don't allow the And I think that's also And this is just, I mean, please feel free, I don't want to speak officially, but I know there have been some issues with, with squatters. Um, and if everybody wants to use a mooring ball, everybody needs to get a turn on the mooring ball. And I believe we've also had some, some Airbnb folks that sort of took up residence on some of the mooring balls. So, and I know where I am, I just don't feel very protected out there on a mooring ball overnight. That's, that's all I know about that. Oh, yes. Let's see who that is now. Oh, Joe Weather. Go ahead. Um, well, this is a, not really a boring ball, but, you know, but there's a lot of different um, protected areas being proposed, these wildlife management areas, and, you know, backcountry and things like that. Are we going to buoy all of those as far as boundary buoys or, or not? And I was kind of talking, it's like the day is coming when.
everybody's going to have a GPS, and if your GPS says you're getting here, this is like a telephone. Like, who has a paper map anymore to find out where we're going? But in the interim, before everybody has that, are you going to buoy all those areas so that people know? I mean, that's all, is that being calculated into the cost? And like I said on, on previous questions, once we know what the final looks like, then we'll have a better handle of what we're going to have to mark. And that's why there's a difference in that we can provide some of the wildlife management areas between alternative three and alternative four when you switch from a contour. It would require a significant number of when we say every hundred feet to where you can do a square where you may have to just do four points and one in the middle to reduce the number of moves. So not really knowing what the final product is going to look like. We don't know how many moves that's going to take. If that's going to be a feasible option to do, but it will have to be something to consider when we get to that point. We may also be looking at putting all of the zones on moving charts, but right now the only thing that shows up on the charts is the spots and a lot of the mirrors, and there's apps uh, that we can start looking at and develop to facilitate that as well. I was just going to add to that, Ken. Um, we are working with the National Lake Sanctuary Foundation to uh, develop a tool that if, and it's an in development and it requires you know, software and technology to all line up. But our intention is to have a product that we can launch with any changes that occur that will be the kind of tool you're talking about. Because all of us have these. And, and it would be a phone-based tool. You are entering a no-take zone, you know? <laughs>
the honest truth is we were struggling to keep up with that because the infrastructure is aging. It sounded, so, like, it sounded like his, you know, his concept for where he wanted to go was, uh, I don't know if he's still here, but he was asking about public private partnership, and I just, I wanted to ask it out loud so he could get some direction on where, you know, where he should call, who he should speak to about that. I have an answer on that, a separate answer on that, because that's state and that case is set so I I know, and the answer to that um, it starts with DEP because of sovereign submerged lands, depending on where he wants to go with that. He can contact DEP. He can also contact me and I can give some more direction specifically on how that's done. DEP does begin the process along with Army Corps and then finally the National Marine Sanctuary also issues a permit based on DEP's approval and that of the Army Corps. And it, it, it is done, it's rare. In fact, we had one come up the other day that had no idea these people had this morning ball, but it does happen, so it's possible to do things like that. Sounds like a good idea. That, that's... Yeah, you're welcome. Okay. Yes, I'm understanding that an alternative plan is yet to be adapted, be it one, two, three, or four, but let's just say for a moment that there was a plan three and or four, it's a combination of three and four, but to say it ultimately it went to plan four was, was deemed to be a post be a best benefit. Um, are we in a position to be able to enact that financially, or will we need to count on the Sanctuary Foundation? Uh, do we know if there are enough funds to decide budgeted for to enact either number three or number four? Or again, will we have to rely on outside funding? Uh, will we find that if we opt for one or the other, will we have to then take a step back because we underestimated what it will take? I mean, again, we talked about mooring walls. A mooring wall for 65 feet of vessel and then having multiple 65, you know, 100,000 pounds of we're talking about. Um, you know, are we able to fund what it is we're talking about doing, or will we have to count on outside sources? Consider that. It's 
is not something we actively do, but this is a subject that Ed, Sarah, and I have been talking about for years. So I would suggest that that, um, given that we are in the draft phase, this is something that we can talk about, and we can think through, um, but it's certainly not off the table. Yeah, first of all, I wanted to join some of our, my colleagues in complimenting the, the quality of the product and the presentations. I, while I think it's possible or likely that not everybody agrees with all the specifics of this uh, plan that's rolled forward, I think most people will probably agree that it's transparent and it's inclusive. And the, uh, the quality of that, all the layering of information and how you can dig down in and really look at the details is, um, is just remarkable. So, so um, uh, my, my hat's off to everybody for, for the quality of that work. I did have a, a question from somebody who's left dealing with the uh, bait fish um, question in the spas. And uh, he basically wanted to see, you see to him that this was a relatively non-intrusive activity and he wanted to know why it was going to be phased out and excluded going forward. So I wanted to pass that question on. So the proposal includes to eliminate issuing bait fish permits for bait fishing in the sanctuary preservation areas that does not affect bait fishing activity throughout the rest of the sanctuary. So only the permits that allow bait fishing within the sanctuary preservation areas would be affected by this proposal. But his question was why it would be eliminated in the spot. He thought it was a non-intrusive intrusive activity in the past. So. Okay, so to that, the proposal in looking at sanctuary preservation areas, they are no take areas with the two exceptions of allowing bait fishing by permit in spas and in four of the existing spas, catch and release by trolling. And so looking at management going forward and looking at the intent of these marine zones, one, to separate conflicting uses, fishing and diving, so those are conflicting uses to allow bait fishing and catch and release by trolling, as well uh, looking at the compliance issues. So these areas uh, used for diving, snorkeling, visitors who come down here may not be super familiar with all of the regulations. They see someone else fishing in these areas that are no-take areas. We may have other fishing activities. So really to be consistent in our regulations um, to enhance compliance and separating people. All right, Steve. Yeah, uh, am I here? Uh, Steve Leopold, Charter Fishing Sports. Uh, I was just about to uh, make a comment the same. Thank you for saying that. All right. Uh, so, uh, bait fishing in the spas is actually the only allowed type of fish to catch bait fishing are valuable. And the permit that was issued was very, very specific that you have to. Well, first we get a, a, a permit, and there's only two methods and two separate permits with two different types of ways to, uh, to catch that bait fish, or valid only fish. The only fish you're allowed to catch in the spa is your, your freaking law. So, um, and I heard you mention a few times bait fishing. Uh, should be, I think it should be more specific when you're mentioning the, uh, the actual type of bait fishing uh, and understand the, uh, the rules and the, uh, the whole, uh, well, the permit. So I just wanted to make sure that everybody understood exactly what that permit is and where you're allowed to do it only in a number of state, a number of federal spas and in none of the state spas. So pretty specific uh, permit. And I don't have a big comment at this point on that, but uh, definitely uh, worth commenting on. All right, so we'll wrap up our questions with uh, Corey about them. Uh, again, we'll have ample opportunity in the future at our next meetings and uh, the public comment periods. Um, but we're already over in different days. So, Corey, if you could. Uh... All right, thank you. Uh, Corey about the submerged cultural resources. Uh, I just had a nice meeting. There's uh, about 10 people concerned with submerged cultural resources here. And we, we sat uh, 
for that half hour. Um, I do want to say uh, this, this entire issue of submerged cultural resources, uh, I had asked early in the process if we were starting to, to talk about everything and break out into different groups, uh, you know, about, you know, is, is submerged cultural resources going to be addressed? And, uh, I was told by uh, an earlier superintendent that there were no issues with submerged cultural resources. They did, no, way, no changes were anticipated. And I think through this whole process, as you probably see over the last seven years or whatever, we really haven't talked about submerged cultural resources, thinking that nothing was going to change. And then today, there's a lot of change. And it was a surprise to me, uh, and it's a surprise to the constituents. Um, and I think, you know, in our group, uh, that we were just sitting and talking, uh, everybody was in agreement that uh, the best thing that we could do is, is to have little late of uh, a uh, uh, working group uh, that got together and uh, met with the staff and, and uh, brought together all the, the cultural resource permittees to, to sit together and talk about what their concerns are and maybe what some of the solutions are, uh, you know, what's good, what's bad, and, and whatnot. So is that? Of course. Okay. Of course. That was my big question. So that's really, I've got a dozen cards here. I'm not going to read them all because it would take up too much time. But I think if we could do that, that would answer a lot of the questions that we have on these cards. Thank you. <coughs> we will gladly do that uh, at, at your convenience. And I apologize for that misunderstanding with regard to previous discussions and interpretations. I don't know the context, but I can tell you that we will work with you to listen and to, to try to address your concerns once you have time to actually look at it. Right. Yeah. <laughs> see what's in there. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, we'll, we'll look forward to putting together an SCR work. And uh, we'll see how that goes. Thanks. Thank you, Board. Uh, and thank you, everyone, for your time today. I know it's, uh, you know, time is our most uh, precious commodity as people, and it's how we spend it. Um, and all of us on the SAC and interested parties, thank you for getting out of your time for this very important process. Um, public engagement, public comment is and has been an extremely important component of the entire restoration movement process. And it serves as an opportunity to help shape the future of our sanctuary. Uh, staff members, please continue to outreach to your various constituencies. We still have uh, the presentations and um, the infographics and everything else that was provided to us, the videos, in addition to the information that's been given to us here today. Please try to get the word out uh, to your constituents. Let them know uh, the process that's happening now. The public comment, as we've heard, is open until the end of January, so we have plenty of time there. Uh, continue to watch the Sanctuary website, Facebook page, sign up for the email updates. Uh, I encourage you to subscribe to the YouTube channel, and then you can keep an eye on the upcoming, upcoming meetings and the opportunities to provide additional public comment. Um, and again, uh, if you're shy and you don't want to speak publicly, but I'll go to regulations.gov and put your comments there. Uh, so with that, I look forward to seeing everybody at our October meeting. Again, thank you for your time today.